today we have uh, Michelle Haas as our speaker. Uh, she studied physics in Hanover, did her diploma thesis at the Institute for Atom and Molecule Physik, Abteilung Spectroscopy, on the topic of long-term frequency stabilization of a neodym laser system for GEO 600. She defended her PhD at the Institute of Gravitational Physics in 2004 on gravitational waves in the new light, novel stabilization schemes for solid state lasers. She was a postdoc at the Institute from 2005 to 2007, then went on to work as a postdoc at the University of New South, South Wales in Australia with uh, Eleanor Huntington. In July 2010, she returned to Hanover to take up a junior professorship on fundamental noise sources in laser interferometers within the uh, Excellent Center Quest. And since 2016, she's a professor for experimental physics at uh, the University of Hanover and works in the field of non-classical laser interferometry. In 2017, she received the teaching award of the university at the Faculty of Mathematics and Physics. She's a long-term member and since uh, 2015 council member of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration, a dean of the Quest Leibniz uh, Forschungsschule, um, principal investigator of two uh, centers of excellence, and also the co-speaker of the uh, Center of Excellence Quantum Frontiers. And her research interests are non-classical light sources, squeezed light in particular at high frequencies, quantum radiation pressure noise reduction techniques, uh, such as through a coherent quantum noise cancellation, precision metrology, novel laser stabilization techniques, metamaterials, as well as high bandwidth, high efficiency photo detection and controls. But today she's going to tell us about gravitational waves in a new light. We are really looking forward uh, to your presentation. And uh, be before we proceed with the talk, um, as usual, uh, you can use the, if, if anything is happening, like you can see the slides or you can hear the audio, please use the chat. Or if you want to ask a question, which we take questions in the end, please use the Q&A window at the bottom to um, ask your questions. We're looking forward to your talk. Thanks for being our guest today. Thank you so much, Christian, and thank you um, the to the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here today remotely. <laughs> uh, and these virtual seminars are a great way to do this. So thanks very much. Um, I realize I'm probably a little bit exotic in this um, speaker round, um, as I come from a background of gravitational wave detection. But I'm very, very happy to tell you something about gravitational wave astronomy today. And um, let's just jump right in. So um, the title is Gravitational Waves in a New Light, and I chose that title because um, I consider myself basically a hardcore quantum optician, but I've always been active in the field of gravitational wave detection. And since about five and a half years, as um, the, the landscape of astronomy has changed since the first direct detection of gravitational waves, um, I could say in German, Gravitationswellen sind in aller Munde. Gravitational waves are everywhere. At least now everybody knows about them, and we even got uh, a stamp uh, in Germany to celebrate the fact that the first direct detection had happened. But now we all know, as physicists and friends, that uh, proving Einstein right was certainly never the, the, the whole story and the entire aim. It's about gravitational wave astronomy. So the first event that we detected is visualized in this little animation over here and was the merger of a binary black hole system, where you can see that space time is really squished and, and churned by this merging of the two black holes. Hopefully it's not too wonky on your screen because I realize this is a fairly large animation. Now, even though cataclysmic cosmic events cause these, um, um, cause these gravitational waves, when they arrive at our detectors, their relative strength is very, very small. 10 to the minus 21 is shown over here. So this is the relative strength, the so-called strain, strain that we um, detect of the gravitational waves. The actual det um, first detection event, GW150914, was actually even weaker than that. So we have not just detected mergers of binary black hole systems in the meantime. We've done that routinely and many, many times. We've also now seen two neutron stars merge, and this is visualized in this animation, which is unfortunately a little more wobbly. What you should see over here is two neutron stars dancing around each other and then merging, and the um, gravitational waves that are emitted are these white arcs, and then you see the gamma ray burst that comes out, and then you see um, electromagnetic radiation, ultraviolet, other electromagnetic radiation, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, and then you see the um, x-ray emission once it reaches us. So we've seen two different types of events in the meantime, and we've seen many events. 
So over the three observation runs that we have in our pockets and that have been, have been concluded, we have um, seen and published 50 events, most of which were the merger of two binary black holes. And these are visualized by these little uh, blue dots over here. So this is the stellar graveyard and the masses in the stellar graveyard are represented by these dots and the size of the dots is indicative of their weight. And so you can see over here solar masses and the blue dots uh, represent black holes and the um, orange dots or yellow dots represent neutron stars. And you can see that we've seen many, many mergers of um, binary black hole systems. And we've also seen two mergers of uh, binary neutron star systems. And um, in order to do that, in order to detect these events uh, well and gain as much information out of them as we can with this gravitational wave astronomy, we need a network of gravitational wave detectors. So we all collaborate in a friendly manner in this global gravitational wave detector network. And you can see the operational gravitational wave detectors over here in yellow and the detector under construction LIGO India in green. So we have the two LIGO detectors, which are quite well known, LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livingston in the U US with four kilometer long arms. You can see the Virgo detector over here in Italy, which is the Italian French collaboration with three kilometer long arms, the cargo detector, which joined in 03. Um, and the GEO 600 detector, which is our favorite little detector, it only has 600 meter long arms, which are folded, so they have an effective arm length of 1,200 meters. And we all work together and collaborate, share data, publish together. Works quite well. Now that um, you know that we have a network, let me briefly motivate why we need a network. Well, first and foremost, coincidence, right? If you measure something in your dark cellar by yourself, you can claim anything. However, you need at least another detector to coincidentally measure that you didn't just detect, I don't know, a truck, dr truck driving by. So we need more detectors for coincidence, but also very importantly for localization of the gravitational event um, in space. And we need to know about polarization of the gravitational wave, et cetera. And the more detectors we have, the better, let's say sky coverage we can get. So I've spoken about gravitational waves, but I would like to remind you what they actually are even though this is obviously not uh, a talk about, the, about general relativity. However, it's good to remind yourself that in general relativity, um, gravi gravitation is a geometric effect. It's um, a consequence of the fact that masses curve space-time and masses deform space-time. The larger the mass, the deeper the dip. And this is the static case. If we however have a dynamic case where we have um, a non-spherically symmetric change of uh, mass distribution, or you could say accelerated masses, then we get gravitational waves. And these propagate with the speed of light. And that's what reaches us. Now, due to the, um, due to the, the nature of gravitational waves, these are quadrupole waves. So what do they do? If a gravitational wave caused by some cosmic event, like a binary black hole merger passes through, let's say me, I will be stretched and compressed because I'm embedded within space time. Um, by very, very tiny degrees, not measurable. Well, fortunately not measurable. That would probably be bad for my stomach. However, this gives rise to the notion that a good instrument to detect gravitational waves is actually a Michelson interferometer. And that's why all gravitational wave detectors that we have built so far are Michelson interferometers. And this image over here that I generated shows a simplified optical layout of advanced LIGO. And I would like to point out a few things on the example of this first and foremost, the basic function principle, which is we have a light source here, the laser system. I hope you can see my cursor. And then the light hits this beam splitter, which is basically the heart at the heart of the, of the, um, of the gravitational wave detector at the Michelson interferometer. And you can see the end mirrors. You can also see that this um, is a fancy Michelson interferometer, which has arm cavities. And um, then the light that um, hits the beam splitter again, then comes to the output of the interferometer and hits a photo detector, um, an optical um, readout, uh, an electronic eye, you could say. Now, we all know that interferometers are great for measuring differential um, length changes. And what happens is that the gravitational wave that impinges on the Michelson interferometer stretches and compresses space time in between the in within the arms. And that causes these differential uh, phase changes, which you and uh, length changes, which you can then read out at the output of the interferometer. That's what an interferometer does. It translates that into a phase. 
uh, into, into a signal, into an optical signal. Now, um, even though we know that, and we know that interferometers are great to do that and very sensitive, it's obvious that we have to become a lot more sensitive to measure signals that are as small as 10 to the minus 21, which I showed you on the third slide. Now, I would like to point something out at this point, because I know this is a seminar on precision physics and fundamental symmetries. And this is very much precision physics because it's all about signal to noise ratio in the end, right? For all of you that are listening, it's probably at some point about signal to noise ratio. We have tiny signals, the cosmos generates them for us and we are now sensitive enough to hear them. In order to be sensitive enough, our instrument has to have very, very low intrinsic instrument noise. And that's what most of our lives deal with, at least as instrumentalists, the entire time to make the instrument quiet enough to be able to detect gravitational waves because we can't force the universe to give us larger signals. We were fortunate to have the first signal that was comparatively large and it was only 10 to the minus 23. So that's large for you. Now, what do we do? I would like to point out a few things. And if you see the slide, it will only change a tiny little bit. I'd like to show you some of the contributions that the GEO 600 collaboration or the GEO collaboration, which is the German British collaboration contributed to advanced LIGO, the gravitational wave detectors in the US, but also the entire collaboration. So one of these is actually the laser system. And I'm very happy to say, and a little bit proud, even though I don't work on this system anymore, um, that the laser system that lives in all gravitational wave detectors currently in, in operation comes from Hannover. So as a Hanoverian, Hannover represent, um, I can say that the laser system is built at the laser center Hannover and is stabilized at the AEI, um, at the Albert Einstein Institute in Hannover. And um, they are so good that they now live in all gravitational wave detectors. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Another contribution that comes from the GEO collaboration is um, the technique of optical recycling. And I'll briefly explain that as well. There is something else that was pioneered um, in a large scale detector, GEO 600, in Hannover, and that is squeezing. And quite a bit of the rest of my talk will be about squeezing. Um, and there are there is another thing that the Geo collaboration uh, pioneered, and those are the suspensions of our optical test masses. These were um, mostly developed in Glasgow, so by our Scottish collaborators. And those are the mostly the technical um, details that I would like to bring to your attention and maybe say a little bit about the cool tricks that we have to pull in order to make our gravitational wave detectors so sensitive that they are basically poised on their metaphorical tiptoes to be able to listen to gravitational waves. So let's have a look at some of the geotechnology that now lives in advanced LIGO as the probably most prominent gravitational wave detectors. On the one hand, there are these monolithic mirror suspensions, there's the high power laser system, and there is recycling as an example in here, signal recycling. Let's start off with uh, the monolithic mirror um, suspensions. Now, why do we suspend our mirrors, the test masses of our interferometer? Why do we suspend them? Why do we hang them as pendula? The reason for that is quite obvious. If you have built an optical experiment on an optical table, you know that you have to be very careful to isolate everything seismically such that stomping around the table does not disrupt your measurement. And so we hang our test masses as pendula. And if we recall, I've actually this time prepared something. These are my, my, ear, my headphones with their charging cable. If you recall, the pendulum transfer function is such that below the resonance frequency, your mass will follow the excitation, which is my hand. If you're at the resonance frequency, you will see resonance as you expect. And if you're above the resonance frequency, you will see that even though I'm exciting uh, quite a bit, so I'm, I'm shaking my hand quite vigorously, my test mass, my, my, phone ch my, my earbud uh, case is not moving very much. And so this transfer function of the pendulum, just a harmonic oscillator, gives you isolation above the resonance frequency, which for gravitational wave detectors like advanced LIGO are below one hertz. And by cascading pendulum stages one from each other, you get very good seismic isolation. So I'll just gloss over this a bit because I would like to show you a lot more technical tricks that we use. So this is a picture of the GEO 600 triple suspension, triple pendula. So you get an isolation above resonance of one on F to the power of six, whereas um, advanced LIGO uses quadruple pendulum stages. So you they get an one on F to the power of eight 
seismic isolation above resonance. And their resonance frequency is 0.64 hertz. So at 50 hertz, you basically have free falling test masses in space. And that's what you want. You want something that is not um, constrained and bound to the ground, it would rhyme. <laughs> So um, in this image, uh, in the schematic image, you can actually see a little bit more detail and you can see this uh, quadruple pendulum um, stage. And what you can also see over here, well, indicated in the schematic, is that we hang our fused silica test masses, our 40 plus kilogram mirrors, we hang them from fused silica fibers. And the reason for that is thermal noise. And because that's such a multi-headed beast, I will not talk about that at all today. Just know that we hang our mirrors from glass fibers not from wires. The upper stages are hung from wires, the lower stages are hung from glass fibers. It's weird, but very necessary. And so I will come to the next thing that is um, inserted into all gravitational wave detectors around the world, which is the high power laser system. And this little picture, in, if you uh, look at it in a slightly larger version and look at some of my colleagues in bunny suits installing the laser system in uh, one of the advanced IGO sites, uh, you can see that this laser system is by no means just a simple off-the-shelf, out-of-the-box laser. This is a complicated system. It's a three-stage laser system, which you can see schematically over here. And this part takes up a large optical table, and it's um, uh, a master oscillator power amplifier system, which I will not talk about in any detail due to time constraints. Um, however, what you see over here is the pre-stabilized laser system. And you can also see that the light of this laser system is filtered by a 33 meter round trip length suspended optical resonator in order to get a good, stable, spatially, geometrically stable mode in space and time. And it's also used for uh, frequency stabilization um, purposes. So recently, about three years ago, not quite three years ago, um, the last stage of this system was actually replaced by uh, uh, another um, amplifier system that also hails from Hanover. And just for the people over here that enjoy uh, seeing, like me, that enjoy seeing um, measurements of intensity noise or power noise stabilization and beautifully power stabilized laser systems, you can see over here that the free running noise of the laser system um, is uh, with stabilization, the out of loop measurements, so the actual noise, power noise of the relative power noise of the laser is at the 10 to the minus, two times 10 to the minus eight level, which is magnificent. And the last technique I would like to mention is optical recycling. And over here, you can just see some suspended uh, mirrors. What am I trying to tell you with that? So maybe a slightly larger picture where you can probably um, at least guess that there are these um, glass fibers from which our masses are suspended. And um, in order to explain the technique of recycling, I, I would rather look at the schematic with you again. And so over here, as I indicated, is again our um, schematic of our Michael's interferometer. And now here comes another really nice trick that you might not know about if you're not from the field. Um, and that is that we lock our interferometer close to the dark fringe. What that means is we go close to destructive interference. And the reason is that we have best signal to shot noise ratio at that point. And you can exemplify the virtues of nullity as Peter Salzl calls them very easily by thinking of um, what happens if you carry a candle into a well-lit room. You will probably not notice much of a difference in brightness, even though you've put a unit of light, one candle flame, into the room. However, if you carry a candle, a lit candle into a dark room, you will see that change immediately. And so you all know now measurements. This is one representation of that. You put your interferometer, lock it close to the dark fringe. And if you do that, then at the output, you have very little power. What that means is all your beautifully stabilized and high power laser um, light over here indicated by 125 watts, but the laser system actually can produce 200 watts of, um, of, of laser power at 1064 nanometers near infrared. If you um, lock your laser to the dark fringe or close to the dark fringe, then all the light due to energy conservation is reflected back to the input. And that's really not good. Lasers do not like that. And you've taken so much trouble to produce the best laser light. So what do you do? You insert this power recycling mirror over here and you retroreflect the carrier light 
back into your interferometer, thereby enhancing resonantly the carrier within this interferometer, effectively forming a compound cavity made out of the power recycling mirror and the beam splitter and the end mirrors. And if you do that, you get more carrier light, more interferometer light in your interferometer. And that's good because your gravitational wave will basically produce phase modulation sidebands on that light. The more carrier light you have, the larger the phase modulation sidebands due to the gravitational wave will be. Now you can flip that thought and do the same thing for the generated phase modulation sidebands that pop out at the output of the interferometer. If you retroreflect those back into the interferometer, you can resonantly enhance those as well. And that is referred to as signal recycling, quite aptly named. If you do both together, power recycling and signal recycling, then you are doing what is called dual recycling. Not the most innovative name, but that's what we call it, dual recycling. So I've shown you in a tour de force through some of the techniques, um, a little bit about the tricks that we have to pull in order to make our gravitational wave detectors as sensitive as they need to be. And now you can ask yourself, if we've done all that, are we all set? And the answer is no. <laughs> that was a suggestive question because we still have quantum noise. And I assume many of you have a background in quantum optics and know about, a lot about lasers. And so you're all aware of the fact that even the best stabilized lasers still exhibit quantum noise. Now, the question you want to ask yourself is, for a gravitational wave detector, is quantum noise relevant? And in this case, I always cite um, sort of a hero, um, Carton Caves, who in the 1980s already posed this qu question in a very um, pointed way. He has um, self-confidence to write an abstract that basically says, I'm going to ask the question and resolve the, this open question whether quantum mechanical radiation pressure fluctuations would disturb the measurement of gravitational waves. This letter resolves the controversy, they do. This is still my favorite abstract ever, never read, read a better one. And so this should um, motivate to you that now we will be starting to talk about quantum noise and how it manifests within an interferometer such as a gravitational wave detector. And secondly, obviously what we can do about it. So let's have a look at a noise budget. This is what we call a noise budget, the design sense, a design sensitivity of advanced LIGO. It obviously depends on the parameters you choose. I have chosen this one over here, which is quite a broadly publicized one. You sometimes see different versions. This is a nice one because it shows you that you have all these sources of noise and because they're all uncorrelated, they all add as the root of the sum of the squares of the individual noise sources to give you the total noise, which is shown here as the black envelope. The black envelope is the total noise that we expect in this noise budget from our interferometer. So basically, signal to noise ratio, this is our detector on tiptoes waiting for a signal. And now if you look at the total noise, you can see, because all these noise sources add as the root of the sum of the squares, um, that the highest lying noise sources are the worst contributors. And which one's the worst? The purple one. I didn't choose these colors, by the way. The purple one is the worst. And at this um, range of um, slightly below 100 hertz, you can also see that this red graph has the same um, um, strain uh, as, the, as the purple graph has. And this um, is, again, thermal noise that I will not talk about in this talk. But you can see the purple is the worst, and it's quantum noise. Now, the purple graph looks like this. It falls as 1 on f squared over here, and then, it, then it's flat over here, and then it rises again. So let's have a look at how quantum noise manifests in an interferometer. Quantum noise in an interferometer is based on the Poissonian photon statistics of the beautifully stabilized laser light that we use. We stabilize our lasers in intensity or power, we stabilize them in frequency, and we stabilize their geometry. And this is something that is very close to my heart because as a PhD student, I used to work on exactly those things. It's a long time ago, but I still have a soft spot for all this because it's incredibly challenging and incredibly rewarding work. Um, and so even though we stabilized our laser light in power, in, in frequency and in well, 
beam geometry, we still have, we're still left over with quantum noise due to the Poissonian photon statistics. And it manifests in two distinct ways. It's like two flip sides of a coin. On the one hand, this laser uh, will manifest, this laser, this quantum noise will manifest as short noise or relative short noise. We normalize to the total power. And in the strain sensitivity given here as HSN, it um, is given by this equation where I would like to point out that um, the relevant quantities that go in here are the arm length, the wavelength, and over here in the denominator, the power. So it scales as one on root of the power. Short noise scales with, with root of the power, relative short noise is divided that by P, so you have one on root P scaling. And the flip side of that coin is quantum radiation pressure noise. The same laser light, when it impinges on a suspended test mass, as you now know, we suspend our test masses for seismic isolation, then these quantum fluctuations will cause the suspended mirrors to move away and to jiggle. It's not so much the static part that we're interested in, we're not interested in that at all, we're interested in the fluctuations. And so the mirrors move under the influence of quantum radiation pressure noise, amplitude quadrature fluctuations of our light. And this in strain sensitivity scales differently. There's additionally the Fourier frequency, which is basically just the fact that we have our suspended mirrors and the mechanical susceptibility of our suspension factors in. And obviously the heavier the mirror is, the less effect the quantum radiation pressure noise has. But importantly, it scales with root of the power. So conversely to relative shock noise. And these two ways that quantum noise manifests in the interferometer are on the one hand, relative shock noise, which is detection noise, and on the other hand, back action noise. And by that, I mean, whenever our light pushes our suspended mirrors away, because of the restoring force, in this case, just the gravitational potential, the mirror will push back on the light field and thereby cause phase quadrature fluctuations on the light. So you can already see where this is going if you're sort of attuned to the quantum mechanics that go on in an interferometer. You can see that the fact that we have amplitude quadrature fluctuations that cause jiggling of the mirror, the mirror will push back and, and couple that into phase quadrature fluctuations. And this is terrible and wonderful at the same time. So these two manifestations of quantum noise in interferometer give rise to what is called standard quantum limit of interferometry. And I have highlighted in the image of the noise budget that I showed you earlier, I've highlighted these two branches of quantum noise. I've highlighted the um, uh, quantum radiation pressure noise branch and the relative shock noise branch. And I will now turn the power up and down. And what happens is that um, if you uh, increase the power, if you decrease the power, then your quantum radiation pressure noise will go down, but your relative sh shock noise will go up and vice versa. So what happens is that the intersection point, the sum of these two noises will move on this um, one on F curve, which is called the standard quantum limit of interferometry. And you can see over here, the intersection point moves on this curve, which means that we cannot easily, just by turning the power of the laser up and down, reach the area under that curve. So this is the, the area that is hard to reach. And obviously that's our goal, right? We need to have lower, in instrument noise and that and because we're limited by um, quantum noise over most of our detection band which for a gravitational wave detector the detection band ground based is about between 10 hertz and 10 kilohertz between friends and so for most of that above 12 hertz or so we're actually limited by um by, by quantum noise and so what do we do right is there an option well what we do about quantum noise as we said turning the power up reduces relative shock noise, but increases radiation pressure noise and vice versa, turning the power down does the opposite. So um, it's basically, um, there's no such thing as a free lunch. What you lose on the swings, you gain on the roundabouts. And that's a consequence of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Can we do something else? And this is a suggestive question again, obviously we can. And I'm just going to briefly mention without going into much detail over here, what we can do is we can redistribute our photon statistics in a way that helps us. So the only thing that um, you need to take from this image, even if you're not familiar with the so-called ball on a stick picture, which this is, is that we can represent a coherent state as this phaser with its length, which is, which is the coherent excitation, and we have vacuum noise on it. right? And so we have this vacuum noise and for a, a coherent state, which it comes out of a well-stabilized laser, um, above threshold, well, well above threshold, um, you can see that we have 
um, our vacuum noise. And it is equally, the, the noise, the um, uncertainties are equally distributed um, across phase quadrature and amplitude quadrature. Nobody tells us that we cannot redistribute that. If we're more interested in one of these uh, quadratures, we can reduce the uncertainty in one at the cost of increasing the uncertainty in the other, because Heisenberg just states that the product of the two has to be larger than a certain value. Let's just use the theorist definition of one. And so that's exactly what we do. We do fixed quadrature squeezing to be exact, we use phase quadrature squeezing in our gravitational wave detectors these days. And GEO 600 is actually, was the first large scale detector that employed fixed quadrature, in this case, phase quadrature squeezing um, since 2010. So we have more than 10 years of experience and constant operation under our belts and have demonstrated that squeezed light can be routinely used in gravitational wave detectors. And what you can see over here is normal sized people. And that is in a way for scale to show you that the squeezing bench is this thing, um, well, not grayed out, sort of highlighted. And because again, that would be the topic for an entire um, talk. I will not talk about any details of the squeezing source, even though it's fascinating. But I would like to mention that um, it consists of um, more than 200 optical elements, has three lasers on the bench um, for different control schemes that have to be active in operation at all times. And it uses a, a process of um, subthreshold parametric down conversion to generate squeezing. I show you a little schematic of uh, one of the squeezing sources from a publication from some of my esteemed colleagues in a minute, if you wanna know a little bit more about this. But again, I can only scratch the surface because I would like to show you the plethora of things that have to go into a gravitational wave detector to make us able to do these measurements for gravitational wave astronomy. So, um, Recently, the colleagues at GEO 600, together with um, uh, the colleagues from the AI Direct, working not so all of us together, or many of us together, um, wrote a paper on the first demonstration of 6 dB of squeezing in a large scale gravitational wave detector. And so over here, you can already see a little indication of um, the squeezing bench over here. And importantly, I would like to draw, draw your attention to the measurement over here. And um, for that, you can see that you see the sensitivity of our detector. So the intrinsic noise of our detector without squeezing in blue, this is GEO 600 noise without squeezing. And if you turn on the phase quadrature squeezing, you get the red curve. And you can see over here that there is a reduction in noise of 6 dB, which is also indicated over here in this graph of 6 dB, which corresponds to the same effect you would get if you turned up the power of the laser by a factor of four. Now, if you turn up the power of the laser by a factor of four, you can imagine that you get a lot of thermal effects, et cetera. All these drawbacks you do not have if you use the technique of squeezing. And that's the um, main reason why this is used within gravitational wave detectors these days. So um, for all of those of you who are interested in how to actually build this, maybe this is a little teaser uh, that you can see. And it, it is a paper from um, my colleagues, um, um, Henning Fahlbruch, Moritz Mehmet at Ali'i, um, who hold the squeezing record at the AEI Hannover. And over here you can see the heart of the squeezer, which is the, um, well, I usually tend to call it the subthreshold optical parametric oscillator, but it's an optical parametric, it's run as an optical parametric amplifier. What you do is you take your laser light, you produce your um, pump light with a second harmonic generator, then you pump your OPA over here, and then the squeezed light comes out, is split up with the dichroic, and is then detected with a homodyne detector, because you have to face sensitively detect um, um, your, your light. And the local oscillator that you need for homodyne detection over here comes in from here, is nicely spatially filtered. So currently the squeezing world record lies at about 15 dB, which you can see over here. The zero line, zero dB, is normalized to shot noise, not the measurement, just the line over here. And you can see for increasing pump power, you get increasing deg degrees of squeezing and anti-squeezing. Because obviously the squeezing is the, um, the short axis of the ellipse and the anti-squeezing is the long axis of the ellipse. Again, about squeezing, you could have a whole different talk if you were interested. And you can see that for pump power is a 60 milliwatts, this is a W resonance system. Um, you get uh, 15 dB of squeezing at uh, 21 dB of anti-squeezing. What you can also see, however, is even though this is wonderful, 
it's at the wrong frequencies. So wrong for applications in gravitational wave detectors, because look at the scale over here. This is the uh, Fourier frequency. This is the measurement frequency and it's megahertz. And we just um, remembered that our detection band for ground-based gravitational wave detection is somewhere in the you know, sub kilohertz range. So 10 Hertz to 10 kilohertz maybe, but we can do that too. So let's have a look at that. And you can see over here, low frequency squeezing done by the same people um, for gravitational wave detectors. And over here, you can see that we achieve 12 dB of squeezing at the right frequencies for gravitational wave detectors. And because it works so wonderfully well, this system is actually not just installed in, well, not exactly, this one is not, in, not this system is installed in, in GEO 600 because GEO 600 has his, its system from 10 years ago. But this system is actually installed at advanced Virgo the Italian-French collaboration detector. And now comes something that is to, still mind-boggling to me. And I've been working in this field for a long time. I'm always excited when I'm allowed to talk about it because of the fact that you can see, and now comes the point that I mentioned earlier, right? What you lose on the swings, you gain on the roundabouts. Over here, you can see um, the detector noise in black without any squeezing. And now you shine in the right kind of squeezing, phase quadrature squeezing, to get the red curve over here. And you expect and you get a reduction of noise in the high frequency range. If you shine in the wrong kind of squeezing, then you get the blue curve over here. Now, squeezing, fixed quadrature squeezing, does the same thing that power change would do. So can we expect to see the negative effect, the bad effect of phase quadrature squeezing at low frequencies? Or to rephrase the question, can we see an increase in quantum radiation pressure noise? And the answer is from this picture, you can't tell. It's, it's the right picture, it's the right measurement, it's just not the right analysis, not the, the exact enough analysis. And so you could, you could maybe think that, you know, okay, if you take the black curve and you in introduce your phase quadrature squeezed light, then it goes down at high frequencies, it goes up at low frequencies, yay. But then you look at the introduction of amplitude quadrature squeeze light and you see, ooh, that goes up as well. So, huh, not decided yet. Let's take a closer look. And that's exactly what the colleagues did. They took a closer look and see what you see over here. Again, um, phase quadrature squeezed light injected. And if you zoom in on the area over here where you might be limited by quantum radiation pressure noise, you can see that you actually are. So you see an increase of um, noise due to the fact that you've introduced phase quadrature squeezed light and reshuffle the photon statistics such that you have an increased um, amplitude quadrature fluctuation, which causes excess quantum radiation pressure noise, back action noise in the interferometer. And you have to keep in mind that these mirrors weigh 42 kilograms and you have basically reshuffled the photon statistics of ein Hauch von nichts, of a touch of nothing. You've basically just reshuffled the photon statistics of, um, you've introduced squeeze vacuum. It's subtle and beautiful. I'm, I'm still in awe of that measurement. Phase quadrature squeezing reduces relative shot noise as it should but quantum radiation pressure noise is actually increased. We see the 42 kilogram mirrors wiggle in excess due to the fact that we've made the high frequency behavior better, which tells you something. We're slowly but surely coming to the point where fixed quadrature squeezing is not enough because we're still doing what I told you earlier. We're moving around on the SQL. We're not hitting or reaching the area below the SQL by this technique. And that's just as designed, we're not expecting that. But so far we were not limited by quantum radiation pressure noise. And so it was not such a big deal, but now we are. So we have to get cleverer, we have to be smarter. And there is a technique and it's quite mature these days, even though it's technically incredibly challenging. It's called frequency dependent squeezing. And because we're getting to the nitty gritty and to the end of the, well, slowly but surely reaching the end of the talk, I'm just gonna gloss over this briefly and tell you that it means that you inject optimized, the optimized squeezing angle for the different frequencies, measurement frequencies of your detector. High frequencies, you have to inject phase quadrature squeezed light at intermediate frequencies at that intersection point of um, relative shot noise and quantum radiation pressure noise. You have to inject quadrature squeezed light under 45 degrees. And at low frequencies, you have to reduce the amplitude quadrature fluctuations 
to not get excess quantum radiation pressure noise. And by doing that, you can then access an area below the standard quantum limit of interferometry. You're basically taking a big bite out of that shaded region, and you can now access this yellow shaded region. In theory, it's difficult, but it's a very mature technique. And uh, colleagues in uh, Japan have, this has been demonstrated in various groups, but I'm gonna show you a fairly new result, comparatively new result, which was done by colleagues in Japan in the uh, Tama um, um, facility, which used to be a small scale gravitational wave detector, but after the big earthquake that caused Fukushima, uh, it was laid to rest and they started working on Kagra, the large scale detector in Japan. And so in the Tama facility, they used this 300 meter long um, tunnel to have used a suspended in vacuum 300 meter long filter cavity to reflect off squeezed light off this detuned cavity in order to produce phase, uh, in order to produce frequency dependent squeezed light. And without going into any details here, is just for the people in the audience that might know about this kind of stuff, the actual result. And you can see that you get a reduction of noise below um, the shot noise level um, over a wide frequency band. And it's optimized for the corner frequency that is relevant to Kagra, which would ideally be 75 Hertz, but they optimized it for 90. It's not easy because what you have to do is you have to employ these filter cavities. And as you know, every cavity introduces loss and losses for squeezing are detrimental. Let's leave it at that. However, this is an incredibly mature technique which comes at the cost of high technical effort. And because I still have a few minutes left on the clock, I would like to show you a very far future, but potential alternative, not for large scale gravitational wave detectors, but you have to start small. You have to investigate techniques that are alternative to established techniques, otherwise you fall back. And one such te technique that we're investigating in my group over the past years is the technique of so-called coherent quantum noise cancellation, which is an alternate technique to reduce quantum radiation pressure noise. And it's a very simple idea that underlies this scheme. I've pinched my own picture from earlier in this talk, which you should recognize. And you have this laser that has quantum noise on it, and it impinges on a suspended mirror. And under the effect of quantum fluctuations, this mirror will move and jiggle. And because of the restoring force, it will push back on the light field and cause quantum radiation pressure noise. Now, the idea behind quantum, coherent quantum noise cancellation is that we introduce some kind of setup. And I'm going to first indicate this as a black box. And this setup is supposed to compensate for these amplitude quadrature fluctuation effects in a way that it acts conversely to a normal suspended mirror. So what do I need? I need something that acts like an effective negative mass. I need something that when I push it, it comes towards me. And what that will then do is introduce an anti-noise process, process, which destructively interferes away the radiation pressure noise. Now this sounds like um, science fiction, I guess, but it's not. So it's actually proposed by some theory colleagues, uh, amongst them, by the way, um, Carlton Caves, who wrote the amazing abstract that I showed you earlier, and Mankai Tsang. And they proposed something which in a theory scheme looks like this. You have a meter cavity, which is optomechanically coupled to the light. So the light shines in and makes this little mirror over here move and jiggle. This is the equivalent to this mirror over here. And we now introduce this black box, which is over here, an ancilla cavity, which contains a down conversion process and a beam splitting process. And in a Hamiltonian, it looks like this. We have this optomechanical interaction for radiation pressure noise over here in this last term. And we want to get rid of that. And in order to do that, we have to introduce two further terms to get the cancellation of this effect. And those are a beam splitting term and a down conversion term. And this is something we're investigating in my group since uh, a few years now. It's maybe just as challenging as frequency dependent noise, uh, fre sorry, as frequency dependent squeezing, but it's a completely different all optical approach to um, noise, to quantum noise cancellation. And we've done all um, the 
investigations in theory and um, in simulation that we needed to do in order to establish that even under imperfect matching of the parameters in our experiment, we will be able to surpass the standard quantum limit of resonantly. As I can see that we're running a little bit out of time, I will only gloss over this briefly and say that we are able to do this as below um, the resonance as well as above the resonance. And we are, and I should say this over here immediately, we're doing this in a tabletop setup. First and foremost, nobody will let anyone play with the active gravitational wave detectors. That's just not on. We're doing gravitational wave astronomy and even multi-messenger astronomy these days, where we're observing in the electromagnetic spectrum um, in conjunction with our friends with the electromagnetic telescopes and neutrino, neutrino detectors. Nobody will let you play with a large scale gravitational wave detector these days. Secondly, um, the parameter range that we're in calls for micromechanical oscillators, which have a frequency of around 500 kilohertz. But never mind, the principle that underlies this is exactly the same. And it's a matter of scaling later on once we've shown principle feasibility. And just a quick, um, or for the sake of the fact that I have a wonderful group working on this with me, I would like to show you briefly the status of our um, experiment. We, in order to realize this down conversion um, coupling that I indicated this GDC, we build a polarization non-degenerate squeezer. And we have shown that with this um, um, non-degenerate um, optical parametric oscillator, we can produce squeezing. So that part works, the optical part is working. We now have to find a suitable um, um, super beam splitting process that gives us the parameter range that we actually need, but that is a smaller problem. And we're also working on quantum optomechanics where we have a membrane in the middle set up that we will soon be inserting into our brand new, well, we're not quite sure yet whether we put it into our four Kelvin or into our Dilfridge um, cryostat, but we will insert it into a cold environment to get rid of, again, thermal noise in order to be able to see quantum noise. And um, as a last little outlook, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that we are now currently at the second generation of gravitational wave detectors with advanced LIGO, advanced Burgo and Kagra operating in unison in order to get good sky coverage and to operate together with our multi-messenger astronomer friends um, to get a better understanding of the universe. But at some point we will have to face some more pressing problems and we'll have to increase our sensitivity more and go to the next that is third generation of detectors. And as an example, I have chosen to show you um, the artistic view of the Einstein telescope, which is a planned European detector, which will be established underground at a yet to be determined location. There has been some pinpointing, but no final decision yet. That will come in the next years, few years. It will be an underground detector, about two to 300 meters underground. We'll have 10 kilometer long arms, and it will not be a uh, an L shape, but instead it will be an equilateral triangle with co-located low frequency and high frequency detectors, three, um, so three times two detectors. And uh, if we have a new generation, a, sec and a third generation, a next generation of gravitational wave detectors, we will be able to increase our sensitivity, you can see over here again, the strain, as compared to the advanced LIGO design sensitivity, which you recognize from the noise budget that we looked at earlier. And you will see that the um, Einstein telescope design sensitivity will be about a factor of 10 below that by making use of um, different materials and different optical wavelengths, at least one of the two xylophone detectors. We will also have, um, uh, uh, we're reckoning with 10 dBs of squeezing within the Einstein telescope, that's sort of the design baseline, and being underground to cancel out or to not be sensitive to or to eliminate the effect of Newtonian gravity gradient noise. So I could talk about the Einstein telescope again for another talk, but just to point out that the next generation of gravitational wave detectors is already chomping at the bit because we have to get our sensitivity up, that is our intrinsic noise down, to get more information from the universe. And if we do that, then what you can see in this image over here is we can increase our astrophysical reach in redshift over here from, um, well, on the order of one-ish. Actually, the first, um, the first source that we saw, um, GW15, 0914 was at redshift 0.09-ish. 
we want to be able to see much further into the past of the universe. And we will be able to do that with third generation detectors such as the Einstein telescope and Cosmic Explorer, which is the um, American, US American um, detector of the third generation that is planned. And uh, with this, I'm nearly at the end and I would like to ask a last question. It's a rhetoric one though, why all the trouble? And I hope that after speaking for about 45 minutes now, it's become obvious. We have to do all these things, you know, all these techniques that I've tried to bring closer to your hearts over here. We have to do them in order to hear many more sources because we've really only scratched the surface. We're seeing regularly and routinely mergers of binary black holes. We've seen a few um, binary neutron star mergers. We want to see more and different sources. And the more sensitive we are, the more we will be able to do that. And with that, I hope I've motivated to you that we that this is an ex incredibly exciting um, science-rich field, something that astronomers sometimes do not realize. This is a science, this instrumentation in gravitational wave detection is a science-rich field. We're, we're doing fundamental science. Think of the um, advanced Virgo radiation pressure noise measurement. This is fundamental physics and I hope it's been as good for you as it has been for me and I would like to end this by thanking you for your attention and thanking my wonderful group for all the wonderful work that they do. Thank you very much. <laughs>